Hi, it's Ramsey Dewey over here in Shanghai, China. So, got some news, man. Pretty wild. The other day, I was sparring, and I got knocked out cold. I've been knocked out a few times in my life, but it's been about a decade since the last time it's happened. So I don't make it a point of sparring at a level of intensity at which a knockout would be a probability, but man, it happened anyway. So I was training some fighters, a couple of guys who fight in Kunlun fight, and my buddy Swan Bo, he knocked me out with a technique that I had just taught him <laughs> that same day. Oh, the irony. It's kind of funny. When you train the average Joe who comes to a martial arts class, you know, not a professional fighter, an amateur, a hobbyist, and you show them a new technique, it's very rare that they actually do it when you spar because they're hesitant, they're not confident in the, in the technique, they're not confident in their own bodies yet. And so if you show them something new, something different, a different game plan, different technique, their body just kind of rejects it and freezes up. Ugh. But a professional fighter is different. You show a professional fighter a new game plan, they know how to follow it because that's their job. And so when I came to, and I see the video of what happened, and he said, Coach, I was, I was just doing what you taught me. I was like, dude, I'm not even mad. Nice job. Now, obviously, we want to control the intensity, but at the same time, to knock someone out with a head kick, which is what it was, a head kick, it does not require an immense level of power. One of those great disservices that I think sports commentators often do is say, he's got knockout power. He's got knockout power in both hands. That's kind of silly to me because I understand how knockouts actually work and it doesn't require this superhuman level of power that only a very few blessed individuals possess. An average person can train themselves to have knockout power in both hands and both legs. It's really not that hard to do power-wise. Position is the key. And that's the technique I showed this guy. The position. Moving around the guard specifically. A lot of people say there's no head movement in kickboxing. Chael Sonnen recently made a video where he was talking about Francis Ngannou and, um, oh man, blanking on the other guy's name, but these guys who basically had a kickboxing match with little gloves in the octagon. And he said something a little bit controversial where he rhetorically asks a question, is kickboxing a real thing or is it not? Is it fake or is it not? Because there's no head movement. And I think that's that's a common assumption, but it's a fundamental misunderstanding of how head movement moves or works in kickboxing. Good kickboxing. Take a look at, say, Ramon Deckers. The first non-Thai to win a national title in Thailand. The legendary, late, great Ramon Deckers. What did that man do? He used head movement, but not the way you're thinking. Not like boxers use the head movement to slip the punches, if you will. Instead, he would use the same movements, but instead of moving around the punches, he would move around the guard. Because when you throw a couple of straight punches and you knock that other guy back on his heels, you have him set up. Because he only has one way to go, which is forward again. To put his weight back forward onto the front of the feet. And so this was the game plan. Throw a heavy, stiff jab, boom, to knock the guy back on his heels. Boom, throw a heavy overhand to knock down the lead hand, to 
create an opening in the guard, shift around the guard to the left. Bah! Shovel hook or hook up high, depending on where the opening is. And then follow from that angle with a head kick. It's a very simple strategy. Kind of looks like a one, two, three head kick. Nothing fancy, nothing ostentatious, but the devil's in the details. In the angles, in the setup, in the hand fighting. And so I'm sparring with this athlete of mine, and here we go, man. We're, we're doing okay. I, I had just finished sparring with a, a much larger guy, much larger fighter, bigger than me. I think he was around 100 kilos. I'm about 94. He's a little bigger. And the big guy, he was playing for keeps. He let me know from the get-go, I'm going to hit you hard. And I let him know, I'm going to play with you. So I didn't feel a need to escalate it into a fight. He's going at a pace where he can turn into a fight very easily. So I'm just working position. Dodging his strikes, parrying, countering, throwing touch strikes at him. Thinking, okay, maybe he'll get it, maybe he won't, but this is not going to escalate into a fight on my account. And as long as I understand the level of intensity he's bringing to the situation, I can control this. All right. So we make it through round one just fine. Actually, not just fine. He did hit me with two heavy check hooks. The first one oh, had my ears ringing. The second one toward the end of the round, mm, that one got me a bit wobbly. But when you're a bit wobbly, you don't always make sound decisions. And this, this is important. And I should probably preface this with a few other less sound decisions that I made that same day. This was the afternoon. This was about four in the afternoon. That morning, I had done another sparring session, another two-hour sparring session. And I cannot overstate how oppressively hot it has been in Shanghai the last few days. How oppressively humid it has been here the last few days. To the point where I have not been able to drink enough water to put back the liquid that I have been sweating out. It's just been pouring out of me. So after this two-hour sparring session in the morning, where I sparred with all these guys, here's a picture of the group over at the Animal MMA Gym, my friend Kyle's gym, awesome group of guys over there. He puts on a open sparring session twice a week. If you're in town, go check him out. Good group of guys to work with. I sparred with everybody there at least once. A few of those guys two or three times. So yeah, we got a lot of sparring in. A lot of sweating. I went from 94 kilos, dehydrated down almost 10 kilos. Man, that's a lot. So I'm trying to put this on guzzling down water, guzzling down a few sports drinks, trying to get the electrolytes back in before my next sparring session. Because I'm leading the fight team. Because we got a fight team over at my gym, training these guys. You know, good, good bunch of kickboxers over there. And, yeah... So back to the afternoon session. Spar with the big dude. Okay. He's going hard. He's going heavy. He clocks me with a couple of check hooks that make me a little bit wobbly. I think, okay, one minute break, I'll be fine. Because I'm not making a sound decision. I'm severely dehydrated. I'm extremely tired. I'm working on depleted electrolytes, depleted sugar in the blood, and I am tired. In the morning session, the last two sparring sessions, man, I had like nothing left in the tank, but I did it anyway. Because that's what I like to do. I love pushing myself when I can't. Man, I love that Jack Dempsey quote, a champion is a man who gets up when he can't. And if you really understand what that means to get up when you can't, not the champion part, forget about the champion part. Who cares about the accolades of the world, man? To be able to get up when you can't. Ooh, that's a amazing feeling. That is the best feeling. To be able to do that. To overcome 
what your body is commanding you to do, and instead say, no, I will express my own will. And then you do it anyway. Okay. So then I spar with, with Swan Bull. And Swan Bull, he's, he's smaller than me. He's about a head shorter than me. Which is why it was so shocking that he head kicked me to knock me out, man. And we're kind of playing. He's not going hard. He's, he's going light. He's going friendly. We're, we're going at a playful level. And you can see he's landing some leg kicks, because again, I'm tired, I'm wobbly. And these leg kicks, without a great deal of power behind them, they're wobbling me. And if I was my own coach watching this from the outside, I would express some concern if I was thinking clearly, watching this from the outside, looking in, not the other way around. But yeah, these these light to medium contact leg kicks are wobbling me at this point. It's not a great sign. Anyway, so then it comes. It comes, we have a few exchanges, we clinch up a little bit, we trade a little bit. I throw a inside crescent kick and I pull it. We touch gloves, we acknowledge it. Okay, yeah, that could have been something. Right, we both understand that. And then, I bring my hands down when I'm outside of range. And I bring my hands up in a guard, a cover, when I'm inside of range. When Swanbo sees me bring my guard up, oh, he remembers the lesson from mere minutes previously, where we're working this out on the pads, where we're working this out with a partner. When a guy brings the guard up, head movement around the guard. Hit him with a stiff jab to knock him back on the heels to set him up. If he's not knocked back on the heels, he's not set up. If he's not unbalanced, it's not a setup. And he does that. Boom! Nice stiff jab. Suddenly, it registers in my brain, he's playing for keeps now. This is no longer a game. He throws the heavy overhand, not so much at the head, but to knock down my left hand. Boom! It comes down. And after all the hours of sparring that day, it did not want to come right back up again, I tell you what. And he shifts to the left. Boom, throws a hook this time. It comes up high and follows from that angle foom, with the head kick into the open space he had just made. Right on the sweet spot between the jaw and the neck. Foot wraps around a little. And then foom, bah, fish dance on the floor. It's funny the real knockouts and movie knockouts don't look anything alike. With a real knockout, a guy gets hit and he goes limp and just boom, collapses to the floor, often in a funny position. He just kind of dives, boom, goes limp. In the movie, some guy gets hit and boom, they spin three times and go flying through the air in this acrobatic dance until splat with a tremendous crash theatrically on the floor. Nobody can just collapse and go limp. We're, we're not trained to respect that narrative from the Hollywood perspective, but in real life, that's what knockouts are. They just, boom, you drop. Now, this wasn't a complete lights-out type of knockout. I remember going down. I remember like, oh, yeah, I want to stay here for a while. We just, oh, man, seriously. And all these guys gather around, and, yeah, my legs are gone out from under me, and I'm like, crap. They prop me up. I'm sitting on the sidelines for a bit. And I'm in a haze again, going through a knockout, it's, it's kind of like dreaming. It's kind of like lucid dreaming. You can be physically awake, you can be talking to people, but you're not all there in the real physical universe just yet because you're still kind of in this dream world, having a conversation with yourself. 
And so about three or four times I asked them, wait, who knocked me out, the big guy or the little guy? And they seemed a little puzzled like that because when you have a memory lapse after a knockout, it's very upsetting to people when they hear this. It scares people, understandably so. But I asked them about three or four times. So, so who, who knocked me out, the big guy or the little, the little guy? And they show me the video. And when I see the video, I'm like, oh, I remember, I remember now, I remember this. Videos are really interesting to jog the memory, which is one of the reasons that I make videos. So I can remember my life. So I can remember the details. And yeah, so we have this conversation. And what's so interesting, Swunbo, he trains at a few different gyms, and one of his other coaches is there watching. And he works at a very reputable kickboxing gym in Shanghai, owns the place, and had this interesting conversation um, with my friend TJ, who runs the UFL gym. And he said, I'd, I'd never seen anything like that before. You know, uh, this guy, this coach of yours, he's, he's over twice the age of these guys. And he, he's sparring with them. I hired a new kickboxing coach, and I can't get him to get off his phone and just pay attention to the guys, let alone hold pads for them, let alone get out and get on the mat with them. This is amazing. I want this guy in my gym. And so weirdly, even though to a lot of us, the idea of getting knocked out in public, in front of people, is embarrassing at the same time. A fighter understands what that means. And a coach understands what that means. And I ended up getting a job out of it, so there we go. It's not all bad not all bad but a few lessons I would like to offer to you from this story here to ensure that you get knocked out as little as possible in training one don't do hard sparring because again it doesn't take a tremendous amount of power to knock you out with a head kick if it lands in the right spot now if you're if that kicks bouncing off your forehead yeah that's going to require quite a bit of power but if you're landing on the neck, on the chin, on that spot right there, somewhere in this area, if you're wrapping the shin around there and boom, the foot slaps you in the back of the head, yeah, and that's knockout city even without a considerable amount of power. You don't want concussions, my friends. You do not want concussions. Now, the second thing is the heat, the dehydration, the previous two-hour sparring session. I cannot overstate the oppressive heat. Yes, I've said that before. I didn't forget. Here's why dehydration is a problem as far as sparring goes. If you're sparring dehydrated, you're much more likely to get knocked out. Your brain is floating around in fluid. And when a concussion happens, your brain, because of the force, let's say you get hit right there, boom, boom and your head whips around, your brain is going to go through that fluid, slap against one side of your skull, boom, and bounce back to the other, causing some bruising, causing some boom, massive electrical signals to go off to disrupt your conscious processes and put you into la-la land. That's a technical term, I think. But yeah, man. If you're dehydrated, however, the fluid that your brain is floating around in is reduced, and so there's less space for it to travel, and so boom, it's going to bump against the side of the skull a whole lot easier. You're going to be concussed a whole lot easier. That's one of the reasons it's so dangerous for fighters to do extreme weight cuts before fights, because they're going to be much more susceptible to concussions than they would be if they had not done the extreme weight cut. It takes a long time to rehydrate. Now you can drink lots and lots of fluid, but to assimilate the water in that fluid, that takes time. 
and to get it back into your brain, that takes even more time. And to get the electrolytes properly distributed throughout your body to the point where your nervous system is functioning optimally, that takes even more time. Generally speaking, more than the 24-hour limit that you have between the weigh-ins and the fight. And definitely a whole lot more than the couple of hours I had between the morning sparring session and the afternoon sparring session the other day. So that was not wise on my part. Now, the next advice I would offer is communicate your expectations to your fighters very clearly, which I did not. Now, I usually do if I'm working with a a group of amateurs with a group of, of beginners, I will be very, very explicit. Light contact, no power, pull everything. I don't want to see a mark on anyone. But with most professional fighters that I spar with, there's there's this understanding. We're not going to kill each other. All right, we're We're going to take care of each other. We're not going to knock each other out. Maybe we'll put some intensity behind it, but, but we have this understanding about the level we're at and what we can defend against and what we can't. So I told them, have fun. Don't kill each other. And they kept the rules. They had fun. Nobody died. They did exactly what I asked them to do. So, again, I offer to you this if you are in a coaching position, whether you are coaching beginners or professionals, always, always, always communicate your expectations. If the expectation is pull the head kicks, make sure you say that. If the expectation is no power, make sure you say that. If the expectation is full contact gym fights, make sure that is understood by everybody not by half of the participants. If we understand this is a full contact sparring session, then we can prepare ourselves mentally, physically, emotionally, and in every other way. Now, like I said before, most of our sparring should be light with very little to no power behind it. Because, man, a few good hits can mess you up. Like I said... That first round in the afternoon session took a couple of check hooks to the head. One that had my ears ringing, the other that had the room spinning, had me discombobulated. There's a fascinating word that the internet loves going crazy over. So, to recap, don't spar dehydrated. Probably... Don't do two sparring sessions in a day. And if you do, make sure it is communicated very clearly, very effectively, your expectations about the level you want to spar at. Otherwise, people will do what they will do. So that's been my experience getting knocked out this last week. So, for those of you typing down in the comments, when's the next episode of Fantastic Fictional Fight Scenes coming out? Well, I've been a little bit occupied this last week in the gym with that pressing matter. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a while longer. Patience, my friends. I'll make it worth your while. All right, my friends, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below. As always, thank you for watching. Now get out there and train.